It's the living standards of Europeans that are paying for this madness. And meanwhile, there are probably elderly people in Ireland and in other places who are not enough to uh, agree with that. Uh, but actually, the European Parliament did. But interestingly, 17% mosey through this winter, but I'm not sure they will. The economic impacts now are beginning to be felt. I mean, clearly the statements from Burrell show they're very slow learners. I mean, for God's sake, this is exactly what we were saying when the war started. It's patently obvious. I suppose what is interesting is that they've allowed that emerge now into the public domain, which shows that the pressure is beginning to bear and these slow learners are beginning to take note. Now, you do have different forces at work Inside the European Union, you have the old, I suppose, powerhouses, Germany, France, and so on, the old um, colonial powers that used to be there, Spain, Portugal, Western Europe. And then you have the Eastern European countries who came in late in the day and were brought in rapidly uh, to bolster NATO membership and uh, actually to provide a pool of cheap labor for Western Europe as well. So a lot of them are pretty gone ho in terms of um, the war against Russia, quite a lot of Russian phobia there. And actually, the lunatics have kind of taken over the asylum a bit, or they have since the start of the war. The countries like Poland, which this time last year were a pariah because of their sort of uh, lack of judicial independence, their problems with, um, you know, failure to deliver gay rights and so on. Now it's actually their attitude on Russia, which is the dominant um, mind. Mindset. But I do think the sort of Germany and France and that are beginning a little bit to sort of question the prevailing narrative. But yeah, they're they're pretty slow at it. And I think the people of Europe are just completely lost. They don't know. They feel completely uh, disorientated by what has happened because the mantra that they hear and they still hear it in the media day in, day out about the war is not matching the reality of their lives and they really are confused and don't know what to do in that situation. Yeah, and you mentioned a uh, Russophobia and you you've been quite outspoken about a uh, Russophobia and and the fact that Russia is a the primarily target of a proxy war. Now, you have been subject to uh, many attacks actually. I I I just you can just simply google your name and I I found an article from the Irish Times, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, uh, calling you and, a, and your colleague uh, Mick Wallace uh, basically agents of Russia and China as well for simply being mentioned in Russian and Chinese media. What do you have to say to these attacks? Because it feels like uh, you and, and your colleague Mick Wallace are, are some of the few in the European Parliament who have, since the very beginning, been speaking out against NATO expansion against uh, this proxy war on Russia and also this new cold war on China. So, so how do you, how do you respond to these attacks when they when they come about? I don't know if you've been asked about them. Yeah, well, the first thing I do is I definitely don't read the Irish Times, which used to be a paper of repute, but actually has become a sort of a, I don't know. They must be getting funded from somewhere because they just try and manipulate facts really to prevail a certain narrative, and I think they've become to the conclusion that myself and Mick Wallace sell newspapers, so they do each one out more outrageous story than the next about us and our exploits in Europe. Uh, presumably now the narrative is we've gone to Europe and we've gone stark raving mad. Uh, we're just, you know, in the times when we're, as somebody said to us, that we're on the payroll of so many sort of rogue states now, we must be worth a fortune, you know? It's just laughable and ridiculous. But... um. You know, I think this is is part of a sort of a strategy. It's a chilling effect strategy. I mean, very interestingly, when the first parliament vote came about, we were approached by colleagues from other countries much nearer to Russia than Ireland is saying, look at lads, I really admire the stance you took. I would have liked to have voted like that. But to be honest with you, I was afraid the way we were de being demonized in our countries was just terrible. We've had colleagues whose houses have been covered in posters who have been targeted, who've been demonized and all of this sort of stuff. It's really quite frightening and it's to chill everybody else that they kind of do that. Um, on the other side of it, 
the platform for us has been absolutely amazing. So every single day we are approached by people across Ireland and across Europe and beyond to say, listen, this is a voice that's not been heard, which just shows you the manipulation of the mainstream media, because we're not going to be silenced into sort of submission. We've got these positions. We were in the Irish Parliament for many years. We tried to challenge the establishment there, did it pretty successfully in some ways now. The Irish media, this is a bit of payback because when we were in the Irish Parliament and they tried to demonise us for challenging police corruption and, and big business corruption, we were there. So when they were given out about us, the people could see us in the Irish Parliament. Now that we're in Europe, they can't see that. So it has more of a resonance, but we're going to keep doing it anyway. But we were on a visit, even that visit to Pakistan that I mentioned, and it's not a country that we would have done a whole lot of work about. But we were in the airport in Islamabad and a man came up to us saying, you the Irish politicians, I love you guys. Again, when we're getting on the plane on the way back, a man said, oh, I follow you on social media. So there's a huge gulf globally. So it's just a load of people out there think as we do. I absolutely know that. It's just their voices aren't allowed to be heard. And therefore, they feel disconnected from the system, a little bit demoralized. But actually, if you added up all of us people and all of the countries anyway in the world's outside the global north, all of those people are on page anyway. Not that they want to see a war in Ukraine. Of course they don't. But they've seen too much of empire and other wars to buy the rubbish that this is just the most horrific war ever. It's like there was never a war before. Whereas the point we're making is we're anti-war activists. We've always been against war, every war. Of course, we're against this one. But the idea of sending arms into a conflict zone, they're never doing it for, you know, for Palestine or for the people of Yemen or anything. Why not? It would inflame the situation. So why is this different? It obviously isn't, you know. So, yeah, I mean, how do we respond? We just keep doing what we're doing, knowing that we're right and, you know, as they say, Oscar Wilde, the great Irish dramatist, said the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. So we, we must be doing something right. Right, right, right. No, definitely. I feel like the more that you're attacked by those who promote war, uh, the, the more you're likely on the right side of, of history. Mm. And you, you brought up uh, NATO a, a few times so far. And uh, as you probably know, uh, NATO top officials, Jen Stoltenberg, and of course the United States, uh, represented by Antony Blinken, were in Bucharest um, this past, uh, what was it, November 30th. And uh, during this meeting, Stoltenberg affirmed a, a interest in admitting Ukraine into NATO. Of course, though, the, uh, Stoltenberg, Blinken, they've been saying this for quite a long time. And have always prefaced it with, well, first, the war has to come to a close on Ukraine's terms, right? This whole notion of self-determination for Ukraine. What are your thoughts? I know that you have recently been in European Parliament talking a whole lot about NATO, NATO expansion, NATO's record. Uh, uh, you spoke out quite eloquently about uh, NATO's legacy in Libya. Could you just talk about uh, NATO's role here in Ukraine, but also... Uh, could you talk about what you think about uh, NATO in particular and how uh, it plays a, a certain kind of role in the world? I'm I'm very curious about. Uh, well, uh, about it's a really it's a really interesting question because actually, NATO was in the demise in many ways, and unfortunately, Putin's invasion of Ukraine gave them all their Christmases and birthdays together. It kind of nearly gave them a reason to you know, turbocharge what they were trying to do anyway by destabilizing that region. And unfortunately, the invasion gave them that. I didn't think that he, you know, he had other choices. He shouldn't have done that. Um, and it was a fatal mistake, actually, on behalf of Russia, because it's given NATO kind of everything that it's wanted, because what it needs is an enemy. And it now has an active enemy and all of the money being spent on arms, a lot of the U.S. expenditure, for example, doesn't even leave the U.S. It goes to the U.S. arms companies uh, and so on. So it's an interesting one because before the U.K. left the European Union, there had been efforts to develop uh, a European army. And this is something that was in 
a lot of the previous treaties. But actually, the UK was always a block to that because the UK was very much wedded to NATO, whereas other European powers, the likes of France and so on, much preferred the idea of an independent European army separate to, you know, be our own masters. And ironically, you would think that Britain leaving the European Union would have accelerated the idea of a European army, but actually because of the war on that, what has been accelerated is a growing NATO. And you see countries like Finland and, and Sweden and so on and all these, although interestingly, and I think it's really important to say this, the people in those countries were not given a choice on whether they would join or not. These were government decisions in the height of sort of a propaganda battle and so on. So when I say NATO is in the ascendancy, I don't mean to think that I think they're infallible or anything like that. I certainly don't. But I think they think that they have a certain wind behind their sails. They're ratcheting in the cash now. They're getting commitments for military expenditure that they could never have dreamed would have been possible. I mean, Germany, a hundred second. Oh, it doesn't even bear thinking about the amounts that are being committed now to militarism, which even a year ago would have been unheard of. And that's what they want. It's their raison d'etre. Um, they want instability to profit from, and that's really uh, regrettable. So ironically, they have been actually one of the winners out of this situation so far. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and Stoltenberg has been on record saying that uh, European members, all members of NATO, will have to raise their military budgets uh, in order to uh, ensure that Ukraine right has has what it needs. Uh, that that's they're they're very clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I'd like to ask you about just overall uh, the situation globally. You know, China right now is also uh, a a huge uh, d discussion. NATO back in June called uh, China a malicious actor that it had to now start paying attention to militarily, despite the fact that China is way in the Pacific and the uh, North Atlantic is nowhere close to to China, but. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that was the new uh, strategic concept document labeling China now a threat as well as uh, Russia. And, uh, you know, over the last, I mean, decade, but really five or so years, there's been massive escalations and Europe has gotten ca has got caught up in this desire to decouple from China to uh, kind of go along with what really is, again, similar to Russia, a U.S., uh, uh, instigated conflict against China. Uh, what has been your thoughts about this over the years and, and where do you see this situation now? Yeah, it's a really amazing story, really, when you think about it, like the power of propaganda and how you can try and manipulate the, the mainstream narrative. I mean, when China began to open up economically, like when I was finishing school, maybe what, 30 years ago or so, well, actually a bit more than that, 35 years ago, um, it was seen as a sort of like the up and coming people wanted to learn Chinese. They wanted to go to China. If you went to China, you were seen, you were the new kids on the block. That was the most advanced, the most um, able people wanted to open up a new world economy and so on. It was seen to be a great step forward. Now, if you said you went to China, people go, <gasps> you went to China? What were you doing there? We all know they're all whatever. And it's the same country. Like, if anything, they've opened up more on that. So it's amazing how you can ma manipulate things. Look at China is the EU's biggest trading partner and will remain so. And we had a really interesting discussion in the last plenary where even the high representative, Joseph Burrell, not known for his modesty or great mind, he had to stuff it into the members of the European Parliament to say, listen, lads, there's going to be no decoupling from China here now. You might as well cop yourselves on in that one. Interesting that it came after the meeting between Biden and Xi as well after uh, the G20, where again, Biden said the same thing. We're not going to decouple. We're not out to, to sort of undermine China or anything like that. But it's speaking out of two sides of your mouth, because while they're saying that on the one hand, on the other hand, they're ratcheting up the anti-China rhetoric as well. They're destabilizing the situation in Taiwan. While they say they aren't, they really see this as a sort of a new Ukraine. So it's a balancing act. They don't want to go too far, but they want to have that in reserve 
in the background. So the Chinese are coming after the Russians are coming. They're kind of occupied with the Russians now, but the Chinese are next. And we get it morning, noon and night in the European Parliament. And it was really interesting that we had a meeting Recently, it was in camera, which meant the public couldn't go. Very transparent and democratic values there and all the rest. But it was about China and Russia interference in Africa. And I mean, when you listen to the even the experts that they brought in who had an agenda um, and they showed about, you know, social media use and all this kind of thing. And I asked, well, have you done an analysis of the EU's um, intervention in Africa and their social media or the US's. No, no, they hadn't like, you know, but at the same time, they said, look, we've no evidence of China doing anything except trying to promote its own interests economically. They're not interested in regime change anywhere. Uh, they're yes, they use social media to promote themselves. But I mean, what would you expect them to do? use social media to undermine themselves. That's frankly rubbish. That's what everyone does. You know, there's nothing. So actually, there's no proof of, of China being a malign interest anywhere. They're just the biggest competitor to the uh, US. But actually, the European Commission and the European Council, who are less mad than the European Parliament, were very clear to say we are not decoupling with China, whereas a lot of the MEPs were saying we have to learn the lessons. We were too dependent on Russian gas. Look where that got us. Now we have to decouple with China. You can't do that. That's like unscrambling an omelette. It's frankly impossible for the world economy to operate on that basis. And one of the biggest things that we're not talking about enough is that the biggest problem facing the globe is the climate crisis. And actually these wars, we need to cooperate with China on that. But this war has actually resulted in the EU undoing a lot of its climate goals, which is really scary as well. So, I mean, it's a, it's a mixed bag in terms of China. They use it to ratchet up the rhetoric and that. And there is a whole new industry now where there's huge money to be made on inflating the threat narrative from disinformation, cyber attacks and hybrid warfare. And they all sound great. And of course, it's brilliant because you can't prove who started it. So it's the gift that keeps on giving. And you've all of these think tanks and that who are making an absolute fortune advising the parliaments that these threats are out there everywhere, whereas propaganda has existed since the beginning of time. We don't say that China and Russia don't do propaganda. Of course they do. The thing is, they're actually crap at it. They're way worse at doing it than the US is, for example, or the or the EU for that matter. So it's an interesting one. There's definitely forces trying to carve a wedge because they see China as being the dominant force globally, which they are and which they will be. And to me, you know, you can look at the war and say this has been a great victory for US empire. But actually, to me, I don't see that. I mean, I to me, it's the last bite of a dying snake. This is the so destructively awful stuff that's not benefiting anyone in the States either. They might have, you know, got the dollar on a par with the euro. They might have succeeded in convincing the Egypts in Europe to pay four times the amount for LNG than you pay for in the States. That's not going to last that long. And the divisions that are going to follow that are going to be uh, severe, not to mind uh, the fact the amount of money that the US taxpayer is having to pay to foot the bill to feed your arms industry is just bizarre and terrible. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, let's let's talk about uh, uh, this uh, kind of last bite of a dying snake, this this empire, because, you know, I, I think you're exactly right. The the these wars, this like new Cold War on China, this proxy war on Russia, it, it really doesn't serve the interests, of course, of ordinary people. And while the United States, where I am, seems to be riding this like artificial high, or at least uh, the the elites are riding this high off of everything that you just mentioned, it seems temporary because there is an economic crisis. Uh, uh, I mean, arguably right now happening all across the EU, but definitely on the way. And this, and the same goes for the United States. So. Uh, could you talk about what the situation is like for uh, people right now? You mentioned in the beginning that uh, people are really struggling all across Europe. But uh, could you talk about who who's benefiting from all of this? Who's benefiting from the fact that uh, you have these escalations toward China? And it seems to be another case of shooting yourself in the foot, similar to what's happening with Russia. So 
So who's benefiting and and what's it like for you to be in the European Parliament and kind of come up against this uh, dynamic uh, day in and day out? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit mad. Uh, the European Parliament is very disconnected from the citizens anyway. Uh, we kind of knew that. So they're a little bit extreme in their views. I think they're getting more and more extreme. But look, at we're kind of used to it. And the fact that it's actually provided with us with a kind of a global stage. And we know that actually a load of people are listening to what we're saying as well. So that kind of keeps us uh, sane as it was. But I mean, you ask who's benefiting. Well, I mean, the U.S. has temporarily benefited, but as you say, it's not the U.S., it's not the U.S. citizens who've benefited from this, you know. It's U.S. big business, the arms companies, the uh, LNG companies and so on. And similarly, in um, Western Europe, it's the same people. But it's actually been in some ways as well at the expense of European capitalism. And we've been scratching our heads at the start of this saying, well, look, at capitalism, economic interests prevail German capitalism isn't going to allow this war to go ahead. They'd be shooting themselves in the two feet and in the head, but they did. And actually what happened was in the early days, they did try and speak out and argue for self-preservation economically, that this was making no sense. And they were shut down really quickly. So to me, we're seeing the coming home to roost of an incredibly sophisticated US funding of media outlets, but also the saturation across the world of US funded think tanks, National Endowment for Democracy, and all these guys talking the talk, but actually, you know, really undermining living conditions. So for ordinary people now in Europe, life is quite difficult. There's been a lot of job losses because of the energy crisis. There's a lot of stories now about industry relocating from the likes of Germany to either the US or East to Asia to follow the cheaper sources of energy. That means massive job losses. I mean, you're right, they've kind of staved it off a little bit by pumping money in, trying to help people pay the heightened bills and that. But that can only go on for so long. So Europe is in a huge crisis. And the outcome of that you'll see in the next elections. Now, they're in a mad panic and they think that Europe is being threatened by external forces. Our democratic values are under attack right, from Russia and China. But actually, our democratic values are being undermined by the lack of democracy in the European Union and how the citizens are disfranchised. We're, we're doing it ourselves, like, you know. So the, uh, the result of that is going to be that the middle is being squashed. There's a, an increased authoritarianism in Europe. So while they talk about democracy, freedom of expression and all that, they've been shutting down media outlets, they've been banning protests, they've been demonising people who have a different view. You can only have one view. Oh, yeah, no, no, you can ha you can say what you like as long as it's what we're saying. And if you don't, you're a Putin puppet or a Kremlin stooge or you're embarrassment and a disgrace. And in those, that works like it terrorizes people. I mean, the job that's been done on myself and my colleague in Ireland has had an effect. There's no use in saying that it hasn't. It has had an effect in making us polarizing and toxic figures, which we never were because the space hasn't been provided for a discussion where a difference of opinion and critical thought would emerge. And that's really scary because the hallmark of democracy was supposed to be an exchange of views, dialogue, you can blah, blah, blah. And we all develop as a result of that, but not now, not in Europe. It's our way or you're not welcome. You're a Putin puppet and you will be silenced. Go back to Russia. This is McCarthyism revisited. Absolutely. Very, very similar. Scary stuff st happening to people who speak out. So everyone else goes, God almighty, I don't want to end up like them. I'm saying nothing. I mightn't agree with it, but I'm saying nothing. Uh, and that's the situation that we're in in Europe at the moment. But that can't prevail. Uh, and I do think there's been some talk. It's contradictory, but there's been some talk about Biden talking about peace. And our position has always been peace will happen when the U.S. say it's going to happen, because unfortunately, Ukraine are just dancing and doing whatever they're told, as in the Ukraine authorities. Um, there's been some contradictory gestures, but some Biden talking about peace, if Putin is ready and that kind of thing. I think the US's allies or like-minded partners in the EU are facing extreme pressure here now and are probably saying, we can't keep going the way we're going. And do they want a Europe that's going to totally fragment the centre, annihilate it, and all these sort of mad extremist right-wingers coming to power, which could happen as well. So, yeah, it's a right mess all over. 
Yeah, it's quite maddening because you've had nine months where the U.S. and, of course, a lot of European Union allies and, of course, all of NATO thumping its chest saying that we're winning this war, we're winning this war, Russia's so weak, Russia's so weak, and then now winter is basically here and the situation doesn't look like that at all. And there is this kind of walking back a bit, while at the same time, you still have this very fervent propaganda that you mentioned, and uh, you mentioned the word authoritarian always used against the countries that the U.S. wants to basically regime change and pull anyone who will help help it out with that goal uh, with it. And so, you know, this chilling effect is so important to talk about. And uh, I wanted to ask you about this threat of nuclear war, because I feel like one huge issue with this propaganda is that it builds up this sentiment, this hatred, this like built in uh, division uh, between people in, let's say, the imperial orbit and those who are being targeted and labeled as authoritarian, etc. cetera. Um, and now it's gone to the point where you have two big powers in Russia and China, which can defend themselves <laughs> with nuclear weapons if they so choose to and need to. And so, I mean, this Ukraine proxy war has brought up this question, I think, to the highest point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm just wondering what your thoughts about uh, uh, this threat of a nuclear conflict sometime down the road are in the role of this propaganda in uh, basically helping to pave the path uh, toward this. Yeah, I mean, look, at I, I don't think a nuclear war is likely or probable, but is it possible? Yes, it absolutely is. And this attitude of kind of poo-pooing it and saying, oh, this is nonsense. There's not going to be any nuclear conflict. Well, that's very cavalier and, um, you know, you only need to look at what's going on in the occupation of the nuclear plants, the shelling around there. It doesn't even have to be strategic. Accidents can happen. Once a war is on, things can escalate. So we can't dismiss the idea of nuclear being used for the first time ever. And you mentioned the point about the West saying, oh, we're winning. I mean, what a sick version what is winning like a hundred thousand dead ukrainians the country in bits millions emigrate it left is that winning god almighty you know oh it's winning if we defeat the ruskies like that's just absolute crap like you know but that is um what they're saying you know so um yeah i think it's it's uh dangerous times i don't think the button will be but if there was a sense from russia's point of view that it was going to lose which I just don't think either side clearly is going to, they just have it at a level where it can keep going and enough people keep killing each other for the arms industry to be fed. It's a meat grinder. But if it actually happened that Ukraine was going to had Russia's back up against the wall, well then, yeah. Uh, would they push that? Yeah, they might, which is just ridiculous, which again shows this idea of winning or defeating Russia is a pipe dream. There is no winning and losing. We're all on the one planet and we all have to live with each other. And this idea that, oh, my God, these authoritarian regimes and we're the Democrats fighting them. I mean, they won't buy Russian gas or oil now, uh, even though they're buying it via the Indians who are buying it off the Russians and then charging the Europeans more for it. But we won't talk about that out loud. But now they are doing deals with the likes of Qatar and Kuwait and so on, you know, because they say we're not dealing with Russia because it's an authoritarian regime and it's involved in an illegal war. So we're going to do work with Qatar and Kuwait, who are authoritarian regimes are, and certainly Qatar is involved in an illegal war in Yemen. But we don't talk about that. That doesn't count, maybe because I don't know why, but they're not European victims or something, so they don't count. But it's such patent hypocrisy. And the EU has been badly found out in this battle, really. And I mean, as I said, I think a lot of EU citizens are confused and demoralized about what's gone on. Uh, but ultimately, it'll come down to how they feel about the money in their pocket. And the money in their pocket is buying them an awful lot less than it did, um, you know, this time last year. Rents are rising. There's a housing and accommodation crisis all across Europe. There are people can't make ends meet. Interest rates are rising. So mortgage rates are going up. Rent is astronomical. And then the food security um problems, the energy crisis and prices. While I said they're cushioning the blow a little bit, it's only a little bit and they can only do that for so long. So I don't know how much 
really Europe can hold out anymore. There are differences between the member states on their approach. They are kind of hanging together because if they don't, they'll hang separately. But you've a lot of elections coming in soon. And I think the types of people who are going to get elected are going to have a different view than what's there now. And it won't necessarily be. It might be anti-empire, but it may not be great for democratic rights either, you know? Right, right. And, you know, I know I only have a few more minutes of your time, so I definitely want to ask you just this one final question uh, before I let you go. Um, so, uh, you know, essentially, I mean, the when it comes to Ukraine, this conflict, it seems like it fits a, a, a trend, even though it is definitely this monumental kind of escalation that we haven't seen in quite some time, maybe since the first Cold War. But in terms of just how the U.S., wages wars and and i'm asking you this because i know that you are very vocal about europe's subservience to the u.s at this point but it feels like you know when we think about u.s wars let's say even just uh, dating back to uh, uh, the first iraq invasion uh, the gulf war it, it escalated into a full-scale invasion in 2001 after massive sanctions afghanistan of course happened right before that massive escalation uh, but all of these wars led to, you said it's ridiculous to think about winning. Well, there was massive destruction and, and just more and more instability occurred afterward in that region. And even the United States, right, uh, had a hard time controlling the situation. To this day, I find themselves in, in a real quagmire in, in this region, in the Middle East. Now it feels like this is being escalated further to the point where uh, the the um, empire is just so outstretched and now it can't really go anywhere else with this except for maybe the most, you know, the next escalation is perhaps the most dangerous. Uh, what do you feel like, I guess, is the, um, you know, what's, what's the end game here for not just this war, but uh, for the entire peace movement, what do you think people need to know about what is at the root of all of this? Because it feels like this is a historic trend and you've been speaking out against all of these wars for so long. Uh, now that there is this McCarthyism intensifying and the conflicts are getting bigger in terms of their scale and consequence, uh, what do you feel like people need to know about the roots of this? And, and what do you tell your constituents about the roots of these wars yeah i mean look at that that's obviously we we need a couple of hours to deal with that but i mean you're totally right like we're kind of at an historic juncture here now where i mean i've been an anti-war activist all my life and despite what they claim that we're just putin puppets or whatever we are totally opposed to this war the difference is unlike all the newfound anti-war campaigners who are supposedly against this war uh, they were never against all the other uh, U.S. wars or, you know, the Saudi wars in Yemen or Israel's wars in Palestine or whatever. We're against all war. And I think what you see and what you've described is the gap between the haves and the have nots is now bigger than at any time before. So if you even look at the living standards of ordinary people in the U.S., the gulf between those at the top with the money and the ordinary people, and that ordinary people could be people in nice kind of even middle class jobs. The gulf is absolutely astronomical. And it's that tiny, tiny elite. They used to call it the 1%. It's probably about 0.1% at this stage, you know, are calling the shots. You cannot be president of the US unless you're funded by these lads. And once you're funded by them, they own you. And you will dance to their tune. But it's so patently against the interests, even of the people who get elected family and sort of mildly middle class, OK, doing OK types, not just ordinary people. So that gulf is global. So where is this going to end? Well, actually, for me, my hope in the future really comes from the global south and what I see emerging and we see it at the UN even, like 77 countries call for peace. And it wasn't that like they hate Ukraine or anything and say, oh, it's good enough for them. But they weren't going to buy the lie that the Russian war was the first war in history. They didn't uh, condone it, but they were saying, well, we have to have diplomacy and peace to resolve it. And you look at these countries where the likes of Africa and so on, where you have an educated and a young 
uh, population who are totally engaged. Like we get huge feedback from Africa. And the people there understand that it's not just the Russians and the Chinese who are down there and they bloody well are to support their own and the US and the EU. And our attitude isn't, is all of you get out, leave Africa to the Africans and so on and let them develop. And I think that anti-colonial mood exists kind of everywhere. And that to me is why it's really tragic that Ireland didn't play the role that it could have in this war. I mean, Ireland traded its new neutral status, its peacekeeping history in order to get a seat on the UN Security Council. We're a tiny country on the outskirts of Europe, but we're obviously very pro-West, which are, you know, half of America is Irish. So we're very well in there, but we were a colonized country. So we get it and we have capital with the global South. If you know, we could have played a really good role in arguing for peace, but instead we argued to escalate the war. So for me, the future comes from the global South, from all of those countries which contain a majority of the world's population who reject war, who reject empire, but we don't hear their voices enough in the sort of global North because all the only opinions we care about is you know the US, Australia, Canada, Europe. The nice, white, respectable Europeans or whatever. But actually, it's the rest of the world, which is the future. Uh, they have the most at stake in changing people. And the dialogue that we have with people from those countries shows me that's definitely where the future is. And I think a lot of people in the global north kind of affiliate with that idea as well about social justice and that and should take great hope out of that, because I think they can kind of teach us. Uh, I think the anti-war movement in Europe and North America and so on has taken a bit of a battering since the Iraq war when we didn't succeed in stopping that war. But the sentiment is still there, but just people can't really find a way of expressing it. But economic circumstances are going to force them to do that. And as you say, the instability of all of these invasions come back to bite us. So it's not actually even in the interests of US empire. You know, the great, the CEO of some stupid arms company might find out that it's his grandchildren who are going to be the victims of this because the planet is going to be annihilated. So, but that's just the rotten, destructive force of capitalism really. And it, it's it's dying days, but that's when it can kind of cause the most damage, but it's an indication of its weakness, not of its strength. Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed. And you even have mainstream economists saying that uh, the next recession to hit the world is going to be far different, uh, longer, and uh, much more difficult to, to come out of because of all the things you mentioned, just mm -hmm. how these wars are creating, uh, I mean, just contradictions that, that can't really be worked through unless a course is reversed like yeah. uh, unless the sanctions have got to end against russia if there's going to be any kind of reversal in that relationship uh, it, it, especially around energy you can't decouple with china and expect the world economy to be stable especially for for the west um any final thoughts claire i know i i know you you got to leave in a couple minutes uh before before i let you go and everyone stick around i'll be around for for quite a bit longer but i, I just want to give you as any any final thoughts before um, um yeah i mean look at it's been it's been a long week here and uh, there's so many thoughts we could be here for a, a long time but i mean i do think that you know dark and all as things are there is a lot of light out there as well and we're generally very optimistic about change difficult and all as it is because people have to find a way and they will find a way and it would be completely wrong for me to try and outline what that course is i don't know but i'm very confident that people will find a way because they always have in previous societies which were rotten and dying and holding back progress people found a way to change them and, and this juncture will be the same as well and i think it's great that we do have, the world is most definitely a really smaller place than it was before. So now conversations that we're having now will be viewed in Africa, in China, in Syria, etc. And that means, you know, for young people and ordinary people, we have a space to dialogue and exchange views. And out of that, uh, I suppose, education and chatting and critical analysis and critical debate between each other, we will find a way forward out of it. So I think that's a, a, a good message 
to take from it and that people in that sense should be quite hopeful that we can succeed in changing things, even though it doesn't look great at the moment. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Miss Claire. I'm sorry for getting out of bed so early. No, uh, these time no, zones I, are very annoying. I know oh, that, yes. Know? No, no, no. I've done this uh, quite a few times. So I, I, I just really appreciate you taking the time out uh, today uh, to, I know you have a very busy schedule and that things are really heating up um, uh, with regard to the EU. So thanks so much again. And I hope that we can talk again at some point in the future. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks very much, Danny. Nice talking to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. Uh, that was great. Stick around because there's still show to go. Uh, she had 45 minutes. Miss Claire Daly had 45 minutes today. Um, and I'll probably be on for another 45 minutes and try to cover a couple of stories. So continue to like this video. Like this video. Uh, we have about 1,000 likes and 1,300 viewers. Great ratio, but keep liking the video. It helps boost this. Um, keep hitting that subscribe button, that notifications bell. Uh, do stick around for the conversation. I might, I'm going to try to cover one or two topics uh, that I have on board. Um, and of course, you know, it's the beginning of the month. And there's no better time to support completely independent media than by uh, pledging uh, support. You can do so by becoming a member on the channel. Um, uh, you can join as a member. I saw someone um, earlier who became a member uh, 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 at the beginning of the program. And uh, you can also go to Patreon. I just put the link in the description, uh, I mean in the chat, and then there's also a link in the description that you can support me annually at one of the tiers or monthly. Um, so please do uh, support me there uh, because beginning of the month is always a time where people are making their financial decisions. So there's no better time than to help keep this work sustainable than right now. All right, everyone. Um, <clears throat> someone said I should have 100,000 subs. Yeah, it's slow growth. We are growing here. We are growing here, but um, it is it is slower growth because, well, this content is uh, not friendly to the algorithm always. And so uh, we are growing because I think the message is becoming more and more relevant. So please do continue to support the work. And that's how you can really support this work is by subscribing, but also by um, uh, supporting it financially, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong or at any one of the options in the uh, description. Okay, so I'm a little under the weather, guys. So I just want to cover a few stories with you, okay? The first will be about what I mentioned with uh, Claire Daly, which is NATO basically saying it's still committed to Ukraine. Um, and so let's just start here. And then I will get into uh, uh, the China protests, and a ridiculous CNN story, which I suspect is actually, uh, it's a CNN interview with someone who I suspect it might be Nathan Law. I can't prove this. It's impossible to prove because they do some modifications with the voice. <clears throat> but uh, they cover the face. And Nathan Law is a Hong Kong protester, opposition force who uh, is backed by the National Endowment for Democracy, has won the Democracy Award. I want to show you some similarities between how they talk and um, you can you can decide. But really what you'll find is that these Hong Kong protesters, these color revolutionary forces were very much uh, a part of these protests in China that have now basically dwindled down. They're basically dwindled down and the media is getting very desperate trying to promote the anti-China narrative, the new Cold War narrative surrounding it. So. Let's get into the first story. The first story is NATO. NATO is essentially, I mean, on a suicide mission. NATO, of course, has over the last few weeks done things like tell all of its members that they're going to have to increase their budget. Now in Buc Bucharest, Romania, NATO met with Antony Blinken, of course, because the U.S. is really at the head of NATO, really in charge of NATO, they all met and they said, and this is from Chinese media, they said that Ukraine is going to be a part of NATO. And so a lot of people have said, well, that will never happen. That will never happen. 
Well, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon necessarily. But indeed, <clears throat> NATO vowing support for Ukraine is a serious thing. This is since 2008, right, where NATO has been doing this. And of course, NATO was heavily involved in the 2014 coup, which laid the basis for the current conflict going on. But this is, this is not an unserious topic. This is not an unserious subject. It's not just words. They do have, NATO does have plans to admit anyone. Because when NATO admits countries into its so-called military alliance, what it's doing is it's building more and more vassals of the United States' military empire. And surely, there is absolutely nothing that goes against the interest. If they'll admit Turkey, because, you know, the EU won't admit Turkey, but NATO admitted Turkey. So if they'll admit Turkey, then surely just because Ukraine is a small Eastern European country with deep relationships with Russia, it doesn't matter. NATO is serious about this. So this is the latest escalation that NATO has uh, uh, essentially expressed uh, this time in Romania. So here you have Antony Blinken meeting with Stoltenberg and the crew. So NATO's foreign ministers pledged to continue to support Kiev at a meeting in Romania, despite many member states having already exhausted their military reserves and undergoing energy and price crises. And as such, a generalized political consensus is easiest to achieve when bloc members disagree over concrete actions. So this is Chinese observers. The reason why I'm reading you it from here is because it's a short report, but also you get the Chinese perspective, which is very important. So NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg outlined the key decisions taken by NATO foreign ministers at their meeting in Bucharest on Tuesday, underlining that the meeting sends a strong message of NATO unity and of sustained support to Ukraine. Stoltenberg said that NATO recognizes and respects Ukraine's aspirations for membership. However, the focus is on providing immediate support as Ukraine defends itself against Russia. So there you have it. NATO is committed to admitting Ukraine, but the war has to be over, right? Ukraine has to be protected from Russia first. That's the caveat here, because admitting Ukraine into NATO would be a signal to Russia of all-out war. That's really at the root of this current conflict. So, of course, they're not going to verbalize that they're going to do this anytime soon. They put in this placeholder saying, well, as long as there's a conflict going, we need to focus on that. But the message is clear. The message is, is that despite Ukraine asking for, what, four or five, however many times more ammunition, artillery, weaponry from NATO than what exists, despite all of these contradictions, the fact that Zelensky could essentially, in the Ukrainian military intelligence, <clears throat> could essentially uh, 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 conduct false flags and provoke Russia, right? Uh, this missile attack on you on Poland, this accident on Poland, which led to Ukraine's government and Zelensky clamoring for the Article 5 of NATO's constitution to be triggered, meaning that NATO members would be uh, essentially... Uh, forced to intervene on Ukraine's behalf. I mean, this is um, this is very serious, right? So they are very serious, and <clears throat> there's a lot of people, liberals especially, who don't take the NATO enlargement, NATO encirclement question seriously. A lot of liberals, especially uh, uh, mostly neoliberals, but really there isn't much of a difference these days. Many of them, what they do is they say, well. Russia has no real concern, no reason to be concerned, because Ukraine will never be part of NATO, and NATO is not a threat to Russia. One, it's ridiculous to say NATO is not a threat to Russia. <coughs> First of all, not only has NATO continuously crept along Russia's border, admitted former Soviet Union states, Soviet republics, Estonia, Latvia, um, Romania, right? Uh, not only this, but NATO has broken the promise that was made, right, that the United States made to Russia not to en enlarge NATO. But also, NATO has been involved in wars that have directly led to this moment. Over and over and over again, NATO has intervened in the Middle East. You all know about Yugoslavia, 
all of that is a threat to Russia as well because it led to this moment, right? The more that NATO has carved out space for itself, domin space for domination to destabilize the world, the less secure Russia is, the more threatened it feels. And so <clears throat> there's no reason to believe for Russia that NATO is not a threat. All of the exercises in Norway, across Eastern Europe, the the uh, 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 Trident Juncture exercises, all these huge NATO exercises happen in this region. And a lot of times they're exercising for a war with Russia. So how can Russia not feel threatened that a nuclear armed military alliance encroaching on its border is somehow not a threat? I don't know how Russia could possibly feel any differently. And after the 2014 coup in Ukraine, NATO came even closer to the border of uh, Russia, given the fact that Ukraine is essentially already a NATO protectorate. It may not be a NATO member, but it's a NATO protectorate. <clears throat> so Stoltenberg, as well as U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, sent a meeting. The meeting was also aimed at addressing the challenges China poses to NATO. Blinken, in a short speech ahead of the a meeting, underscored the concept of unity and alliance according to the release of the White House. Zhang Hong, an associate research fellow at the Institute of Russian, Eastern European, and Central Asian Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, believes there is a new peak of antagonism amid airstrikes on key infrastructure of Ukrainian cities, knocking out power and uh, swatter services. So, yeah, I mean, that's a big reason why we're hearing about <coughs> NATO and Ukraine, okay? Because... NATO feels like it needs to pledge more support to Ukraine because Russia is, in fact, winning. Russia is, in fact, doing a whole lot to achieve its objectives. Now, it's not necessarily the fastest development. It's not necessarily something that's happening today. Um, there is this slow grind. The winter is likely to see offensives, right, because that's the time Russia will have to strike with its mobilization, the the terrain will be a lot more complicated because of weather conditions. All of this plays a role. And Russia has recently conducted in the last few weeks and, and since October, really, a flurry of missile strikes on Ukraine, knocked out about 70% of its electricity infrastructure and, of course, other infrastructure as well in order to demilitarize. That is what the goal has been from the beginning, and that's what is happening. You demilitarize, you know, you know in order to demilitarize Ukraine, it can't have a uh, power. And that might sound absolutely horrific because it does have a civilian cost, but this is kind of the bed that Ukraine's military has made. And of course, NATO has made first and foremost by provoking this conflict, right? It was always going to lead to this. So long as a special military operation had to then move forward and escalate into something a lot larger than that. So, so another research fellow at, at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences said that the U.S. and Europe want to enhance NATO's scale and level of solidarity through the crisis and political consensus of supporting Ukraine against Russia. And that's the easiest decision to make. But the members have divergences over concrete agendas, such as Turkey's opposition to Finland and Sweden's membership, not to mention that many have exhausted their equipment reserves. And so Stoltenberg admitted in a German newspaper that Western countries' military and financial support to Kiev is coming to a cost to their societies, a dire cost to their societies. Rising food and energy bills means hard times for European households. New York Times also said on Saturday, that the U.S. and NATO scramble to arm Ukraine and refill their own arsenals, saying a NATO official who said that in terms of providing weaponry to Ukraine, smaller countries have exhausted their potential with 20 of its 30 members tapped out. The chairman of NATO military committee, Rob Bauer, said strains on stockpiles are across the board, but that Russia is having the same problem, which is arguable. I don't, I don't think that Russia is having the same problem. I think that Russia actually because it's been able to take its time with this, has had a lot more time to get its stockpiles exactly where they need to be. We're not allies on the same page, one advisor told Macron, AFP, uh, 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 forecasting challenging talks um, with Biden. 
because Macron right now is meeting with Joe Biden. And that you can see all the disgusting pictures they're taking on social media. We're so much friendly. That's all a charade. NATO emphasized unity at the four ministers meeting when they're trying to tamp down widening divergences, adding that a consensus on principles to yield substantial results and actions may be increasingly difficult because of thorny internal problems, which will force country leaders to weigh wins and losses with different perspectives. So while there are reports that U.S. officials are nudging Ukraine to peace talks with Russia, their sincerity is questionable. Sincerity is questionable because the U.S. has made a great fortune by supplying energy to the EU, realizing its goal of containing Russia and strengthening the transatlantic par partnership, said Kui, Kui Hang, a research fellow at the East China Normal University. <clears throat> so the NATO agenda is very much a U.S.-led one. Bringing the China challenge to the NATO table is not surprising when the U.S. keeps rallying transatlantic allies to its value and ideology. And so, you know, that's what's happening. Basically, NATO is saying that it's committed to Ukraine. It's also committed to opposing China. So NATO is trying to expand both its membership and its scope. And that is very, very, very dangerous. We should all be paying attention to the fact that NATO is not stopping here. While there are incredible costs and there may be setbacks, there may be times in the next several months where NATO has to say, well, we have to cut our losses. We have to be able to scale back just a little bit, even if that just means stagnation and not moving forward. Indeed, NATO is already thinking about how to admit Ukraine into NATO and how to include China in its military activities, in its military interventionism. I mean, that, that tells you all you need to know about NATO's principal interest is to serve the U.S. empire. That's the roots of NATO. That's why NATO exists in the first place. And this is an ending with the Ukraine crisis and the Ukraine conflict. NATO is not just looking at Ukraine. It's looking at Russia. Its primary adversary is Russia. It's not to defend Ukraine. It's not to allow Ukraine to be protected from so-called Russia, Russian invasion. It's not about that. It is about expanding its uh, basis, its membership base. It's to expand its capacity to contain Russia and to get in on, right, to get in on what is increasingly a boon, which is the aggressive posture of the United States toward China. So there are many crisis points here that have not yet been addressed or resolved. You have the economic crisis that is ongoing and only set to escalate and worsen in the coming months because there's really nothing that the U.S., and its European partners can do to make up the shortfall of the uh, uh, Russian energy um, uh, that's been cut off because of sanctions. So that in and of itself is going to cause the plunge. You'll have a crisis of overproduction because workers will have job loss. They will have wage cuts, which have already been happening. So that's going to cause a general crisis in the economic system. You also have the fact that NATO is out of weapons. NATO can't really, they can promise all of the money in the world to Ukraine, but when those weapons will actually be made and sent to Ukraine is a question. Uh, I was listening to Brian Berletic and he was saying something like, well, Defense News, uh, 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 the Defense Department is saying they might be able to get some of the weapons they promised to Ukraine in 2023 at some point. But it's likely that a lot that are being promised now, it's going to take maybe longer than that. Do I think that Ukraine has until past 2023 to really keep this conflict going? Not really, right? And Ursula, uh, 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 the EU uh, head, her comments about 100,000 Ukrainians having died is a, is a severe underestimation, meaning that you've had probably... 200,000 Ukrainian soldiers die in this conflict over nine months. You're talking about somewhere between uh, uh, 10 to 20,000 per month, right? And now you have hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers, about 200,000, ready to be deployed on the front lines. And that's going to cause even more casualties. <clears throat> and with what weapons will Ukraine's military fight with? if they are already blowing through all of the stockpiles that they have been given from the American empire and its vassals in NATO. 
very unclear, but it seems like uh, time is ticking for Ukraine and uh, NATO is just going to continue to try to ride this wave and expand at the expense of NATO. So I just wanted to cover that story real quick before I get to the next one, okay? Because I think that, um, well, there's a lot we can talk about. And a lot has been happening, okay? Um, But we have, okay, and apologies. I'm a little under the weather. Um, But so I don't – I feel like I sound nasally. But I want to cover one other thing, okay? So – <clears throat> you all have been cov- you know we covered the protests that have had happening or have happened in China. They've seemed to die down a lot. And you know, the Chinese government has responded. China is um changing its COVID policy. Now, I think it's not accurate to say that China's COVID policy will change to the point where it will be, um, you know, where where they will just relax everything and, and kind of lie flat, as they say. But nonetheless, changes have come. And uh, some could say it's in response to the protest. But honestly, even before the protest, the, the changes were coming. So if you read Chinese media, you can see reports of that. We covered here with Garland Nixon and Margaret Kimberly how these protests have been exploited and if not organized by agents in the Western media, people in Radio Free Asia, CNN, BBC, on Telegram, using VPN, speaking with professional activists, right, to, especially around the Shanghai protests, to stage this debacle, right, to stage the anti-regime change messages. <clears throat> it follows the Hong Kong playbook from 2019 to try to create a crisis where China looks like this authoritarian quote unquote dictatorship and uh, that there's some kind of pro quote unquote democracy movement that is sweeping the, the, the country. Nothing could be further from the truth. These protests were always relatively small. Um, they didn't really have many demands, but with what demands they did have, such as please change the COVID policy to some level where it's more convenient. Well, China is now saying that they are going to move toward um, people first policy rather than COVID first policy. That doesn't mean though that they're not going to consider COVID still. I would really, I mean, really doubt that uh, there's going to be significant change to the point where, you know, it's like the United States and uh, we live in kind of a, a post-COVID era, an endemic era. That's not going to happen. But changes are coming, have already come, especially around testing, quarantine, right? That's happening. And, of course, some could say, well, Chinese people protested and something good happened. That's true. This happens, though. People in China protest quite a lot. It's just that the only time these protests are covered is when they serve Western interests. And that's a really important distinction to make. We have to make that distinction. And when they serve Western interests, we should be more than suspicious. We should probably already be thinking about rejecting them because the West never supports a protest that doesn't serve imperialist interests. It just doesn't. Whether it's Iran, Venezuela, whether it's China, never. So now that these protests are dying down, CNN published a ridiculous piece yesterday, but that I could not help but want to play. So let me share my screen. And I want to ask you if this voice sounds familiar. Now, <clears throat> I'm just going to put a disclaimer on here. I'm not saying that this is somehow some kind of, um, how should I say, smoking gun that CNN is interviewing a Hong Kong, major Hong Kong protester to smear China. I don't know that. I really don't. It could be that um, 
you know, this is just a different protester, right? Or, or a different person. But there's a lot of uh, strange similarities, and it's not just the voice. It's both the message and um, where they reside, okay? So here's CNN. Look at this. So, I mean, we can just break this down pretty, pretty easily, okay? Chinese student risks his and his family's lives to speak out against restriction, China's COVID restrictions. In an exclusive interview with Aaron Burnett, uh, sh- she speaks to a Chinese student living in England now, risking his life to speak out against China's attempts to suppress demonstrations that erupted across the country against the government's COVID policy. So, I mean, the propaganda is just so clear. How is, just just to begin, how is somebody, <laughs> think about this. And the McCarthyism, as, as Claire and I were talking about, I mean, it's just so rampant. Can you believe this? I mean, can you <laughs> think about this? This student is in England. They're not even in China. How are they risking their life being in England? It's absolutely uh, uh, ludicrous. But look at the look at this. I'm gonna play the uh, the audio now, just quickly. I don't know if I'm gonna get copyright, so uh, hold. Uh, 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 let me let's let's play this just a bit. He is from the eastern part of China. He is now studying in England. And this is an interview you'll see only here. I began by asking him about his family, who are still in China. I asked whether he's worried about them. Here's his response. Yeah, I'm absolutely worried about them. But I think I, I, I still need to do something because they, some, some people in, in China, they are protesting against the government. So they are taking much more, much bigger risk than me. So even that, even if I, uh, I, I, I am worried, but I have to do this. When you say you have to do this, what made you decide to actually protest? My peers and I have the uh, have my duty to like do something to call for their human rights and a normal life for the people in China. Sorry, before I go on, sorry about that. I was muted. But before we go on, people in the chat were already saying that's a British accent, right? Like you can tell. And I'm wondering if there's a Hong Kong connection because that's what I'm wondering. I'm only speculating here. I can't prove this, but immediately, right? Because I've done a lot of research on Hong Kong protests, opposition protests. And this person sounded like a particular opposition protester. Uh, Nathan Law. You all know Nathan Law, right? He is a uh, 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 so-called pro-democracy protester. He lives in England. He lives in the UK. Uh, so similar to this Chinese student. And he sounds pretty similar. So here is... Continue to pay attention. Off. Here is Nathan Law. What's going on in Hong Kong? Because um, the erosion of freedom in Hong Kong is actually the reflection of uh, the aggressiveness and uh, the authoritarian expansion from mainland China. And it will eventually put a risk on every single country in the world, including democratic ones that we are living in. So of course, it's not the exact same voice because they obviously manipulate the voice a bit. Um, but it sounds quite similar, in my opinion. It sounds quite similar. And <coughs> they manipulate the voice a bit on CNN. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a lot of similarities. There's obviously a Hong Kong connection here, not just by the accent, but by the message. And to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if it's Nathan Law. They cover the face. They do voice manipulation. Um, 
and all of this is to portray China as so dangerous that just showing this person's face would put him in danger. But I think uh, quite the contrary. Um, this is all a propaganda smear. This is CNNIA working, Operation Mockingbird at work, trying to portray China as uh, so utterly regressive and repressive, despite the fact that China is responding to these protests in kind and in a progressive way, right? Protesters have problems. Uh, uh, people have issues, especially netizens. That's been a big issue is people have been frustrated with some aspects of the COVID policy. And uh, it's been changing. But let's continue to listen to it because it gets cringier and cringier. Have you spoken to your friends who are in China and are they scared? They are mostly worried about what will happen after these protests and after the, the lockdown because the Chinese government is imposing restrictions even harder on, this, uh, on the control of the speech, of assembly and on demonstration. Some people were arrested during the protest, and they the, the 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 much more worse is they are randomly checking the forcing the the, the citizens to hand handing their the their phones. They don't respect the human rights of privacy, privacy and liberty. Do you see the show being put on here? First of all, none of this is care is cared with any evidence. Sure, China, uh, Chinese police did arrest some of the protesters, especially those who were causing literal like uh, 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 disruptions leading to, to possible violence. But uh, by far, Chinese police have taken these protests much more lightly than uh, uh, anything that could be said about the United States and the UK, especially with regard to their own protests. So you have the UK, Canada, like literally banning protests. You have people like Ron DeSantis in Florida literally banning protests. And you, of course, have police departments all across the country brutalizing protests whenever they emerge in the United States. But nonetheless, all of this that he's saying is completely without evidence. Aaron Burnett doesn't, doesn't push back because this is all part of the show, even just the way that he's speaking. Right. You can tell that they're trying to make him sound like he is scared. Right. He's pausing. He's having a hard time getting his words out. I don't believe for one minute that this is a genuine portrayal. It just feels very uh, much manipulated and uh, uh, and and all about performance. Right. And so this is CNN CIA trying to make you uh, feel like China is doing all these things that we can't verify. We can't verify how come there has been mass outrage. You don't think that the Chinese police were uh, uh, on the mainland taking people's phones uh, from them during at protests, right? Uh, monitoring them. You don't think Chinese people would be mad at that? I don't. I, I've never. You know. Uh, you don't think there there would be footage of that? You have Chinese people all across the mainland at these protests taking video. You don't think that they would take video of that? That's the problem with all of this, that it's a lot of storytelling. It's a lot of lie, a lot of just a lot of lies. You experienced the lockdown in Shanghai at university. I know before you moved to England for school and I know they told you how that the lockdown there would be six to seven days, but it ended up being three months. And some of the details of what you experienced are really hard and frankly incredible to imagine. Can you tell us about things like using the bathroom and about the food? In, in the in the lockdown, the Shanghai, the, the, the all access to Shanghai is controlled or are controlled by the government, which means um, you any anyone that wants to transfer some resources like the food, like the vegetables, meats, they have to get the official permit permission uh, from the government. The, the foods we are receiving, we receive like is most uh, many times we, we eat something very bad. And some some made made it like stomach cake or some there's some bugs in the in the foods in the and there are some residents receiving the the bad vegetables the bad meats and even some uh, received none of them they are starving at home and even someone like died died because of the starving so it's very bad and also like uh, in the 
so I mean, all of that is propaganda. Uh, a person didn't die of starvation in Shanghai. Um, uh, uh, they died in their apartment. Uh, the causes are unknown. They didn't die of starvation. The problem, you know, Shanghai did have problems in the beginning of its. Uh, we covered it here with Andy Borum, who is is based in Shanghai. There were problems logistically in the beginning. That's true. You know, especially around food deliveries. But to say that it was all Chinese government uh, uh, directed is false. The food delivery system was actually directed by what they call a uh, group buy, which means that people in residence buildings would come together and they would, and the government did help uh, uh, facilitate an app which allowed them to request resources as a group <coughs> to be distributed amongst themselves individually once it was delivered in order to uh, make it more efficient rather than a single individual each buying and sending their requests on this app and then having the deliveries uh, be be more and more staggered and divided. This is where about uniting them and it got better and better over time. Sure, there were mistakes, but this is just comical the way that this is portrayed that, uh, oh, there was bugs in the food and bad vegetables. I mean, this is how low they have to get around China in order to make China look bad. If if China actually had, uh, uh, I mean, imagine if China had the problems that the United States had. Imagine if China had hundreds of people uh, during every winter season die of uh, homelessness because they don't have anywhere to live. What if that? What if China had thousands of people die because they didn't have health care? What if China had a thousand people being killed per year by their police departments, by their local police? You know, what if China had a prison population of two million and, you know, uh, uh, we can go on and on and on. The fact that bugs in the food is what we're talking about here, right? And I assume he means fruit flies or something of that sort. Um, uh, uh, imagine if we're talking fruit flies and some rotten food. Uh, versus, right, the United States letting a million plus people die of COVID. I mean, <coughs> what's the trade off here? And I think uh, right now China is really working toward balancing this trade off because public opinion is changing. But for the longest time, Chinese people, right, uh, approval of the Chinese government increased from 95 to 98% by Western observers' standards during COVID. Because of their response. So this person is pushing propaganda and the CN CNN is acting like the CIA promoting it. Who even asked this? The bathroom. What about the food in the bathroom? Like what? Incredible. Restrictions in the lockdown, we, we talked all night at the beginning. We played card games 15 days. But after those days, we were like, we don't want to do anything. We just lie down on, on the bed and staring at the ceiling, wasting our time because our, 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 our spirit is actually exhausted. How the world is watching these protests now and wondering how big this will get and whether this is about more than just zero COVID, whether it's about freedom in a bigger sense. What do you think of Xi Jinping's <coughs> leadership? I think... Uh, it's a continuous dictatorship of the of the country because there are many people are uh, not comfortable and agree with him, but no one can just maybe say they, they can't speak out speak out that they don't like him because if you do, you might be monitored and maybe you'll be arrested, maybe you're in custody. It's like a control of your liberty. I mean, there you have it. Uh, hold on. So there you have it. CNN acting like the CIA. Who talks like this as a real person? They're trying to make this person out to be out. They have his face covered, his voice manipulated. I still think it's Nathan Law. I know I showed you a quick soundbite of that. I still think it's Nathan Law. I'm just going to believe it's Nathan Law because obviously this is a Hong Kong opposition protester who lives in England now, who is just smearing China in the Chinese government. Um, 
literally she asked him about Xi Jinping. Honestly, if you're living in England and promoting this vitriol, this anti-China narrative, I, I don't think you have much of a right to talk about Xi Jinping, really, in my opinion. But who talks like this? Liberty, human rights, freedoms. These aren't things that ordinary people generally talk about unless they're told to, right? It, it, all the questions were very leading. What about the bathroom? What about Xi Jinping? It's obviously that there was a script already. This was very scripted. This was an operation. This was Operation Mockingbird at work. And it's it, literally you have Aaron Burnett saying, oh, well, how big will these protests get? They're already dwindling. The Chinese government is very quick to respond, not, not just the protests, but to just when people have issues. When people have issues, especially the central government, is very, very fast. And that's, that's what's happened. The central government has been incredibly rapid in its response to, um, in its response to the uh, 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 lowering of public opinion around certain parts of the COVID policy. And I just want to, again, stress that this is not all parts of the COVID policy. There will not be a 100 to 0 shift, right? There, there were particular grievances, especially around testing, because there was a lot of testing going on. There was some excesses in certain localities. There was uh, testing of people who were sort of second, third uh, contacts, the people who might have been exposed, who weren't feeling ill at all. And they were testing every day. And if they were in a certain, they couldn't go out into the community, right? These kind of things. And then, you know, the quarantine policy is also shifting. It already has been shifting, but it's likely to shift a bit more, um, uh, especially around taking people to medical facilities. So one controversial topic is, do you bring a sicker, older person? Let's say they have a, a diagnosis like um, cancer, for example, some kind of cancer diagnosis, already immunocompromised. Do you take them out of their home to a medical facility um, when they first test positive for COVID, knowing that medical facilities could put you at risk of further contracting disease? There were some excesses where COVID policy was taken so fervently and seriously that, yeah, older people, sicker people were being put into medical facilities that were, <coughs> at, that were putting them at risk of further illness. And so China is now reforming that. So those are just two examples. But of course, none of this is being talked about by the clown show that is CNN and the Western corporate media. These protests were from the very beginning an attempt to try to foment another color revolution a la Tiananmen Square, which never was going to gain traction in the first place. Because to be honest, the United States just doesn't have it like that anymore. The United States and China are in divergent paths. China's rise is so, I think, uh, impressive that it's been preparing for these moments for quite some time, and it knows how to respond when the U.S. decides to get peckish and tries to overplay its hand. And that's what the United States has done here, trying to use, I mean, I've seen things about Hong Kong opposition, Taiwan opposition, coming into the mainland, working with the BBC, et cetera, in order to... Um, smear China. Now, I'm just going to um, play one more thing for you all before I prepare to end. It's great. It's only a quick four-minute video, and then I'll react to it. I want you to watch the whole thing. Hua Chunying is a representative. She's a spokesperson for the foreign ministry in China, and this has been going around. And so I want to play this and then do a quick commentary before I head out here. Um, it's great. It's it, it's a, it's to the BBC. So this was back in January. But I just want to show you how the Western corporate media acts as an arm of regime change. And the BBC is basically an arm of the MI5. And it's basically an arm of the Western imperial regime change operation against China, the new Cold War. So here you have BBC chief propagandist Laura Kussenberg, uh, Kunzberg. Get absolutely eviscerated by China's foreign ministry spokesperson Hua Chunying. This is great. It's five minutes, and she destroys the credibility in just a short period of time. So here, I'm going to play it uh, in full. From BBC News, and I want to ask about the video you showed us earlier. Mm -hmm. 
which was about the BBC's relationship, as you described it, with Adrian Zenz. Mm. I was the producer who worked on all, all our reports on Xinjiang, which featured Adrian Zenz. Mm. I've never met the man who was in that video. I've never spoken to him. I've never exchanged an email with him. Mm. So I don't understand why it is that he's supposed to have some expertise or insight into our supposed relationship with Adrian Zenz. If you would like to know the details of how we worked with Adrian Zenz, why don't you ask us? And indeed, any media outlet who wants to know about that is very welcome to put a question to us about it. Secondly, I'd like to correct what you said about regulation in the BBC. The BBC is regulated. We have to abide by Ofcom regulations. As I'm sure you'll know, that's the body which recently withdrew CGTN's licence to broadcast in the UK. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to have you here today. That's very good. Can you please take that part again? Britain is the largest daily circulation newspaper. Put it in the place where there was a tweet and tweet. Right now, let's talk about propaganda and spin and anti-China propaganda and where the media gets its stories from. There are two main sources of information that they get these stories from. The media's main source of the information is a man named Adrian Sims. Adrian Sims, Sims, whatever you want to call it, is German. And he's also a religious zealot. The media. So you should find the answer. First, 这个人我也不认识，我是在 YouTube 上看到的，但是我觉得非常有意思。第二，你说你是 BBC 的 producer， 你不认识他，为什么会有？我觉得也很正常，因为他说 BBC 问他要，不见得就是你本人问他要，对不对？然后你可以看到，他是从郑国恩他自己本人的推特上来看到的，因为 BB 郑国恩他自己发的推特说 BBC 问他要 evidence， 他觉得这很难。很难，因为太少了，所以 BBC 去给他 commission 了。他如果他又去找了更多的证据，所以这是郑国恩自己的推特推文上说 BBC 来问他要的。但这个 BBC 是你呢，还是你的同事呢？这我就不知道了。这可能需要你们 BBC 内部呢再做进一步的这个呃调查，把这个事情弄清楚，就到底他的证据哪里来的？我觉得可能。这样的话呢，对你们 BBC 挽回你们的信誉呢，也是有好处的。嗯，你至于说到你好像有点不太服气哈 ，BBC 的这个，但是呢，很多的证据其实已经很清楚了。比如说，铁证如山的，今年一月份 BBC 播出的《重访武汉》，它当中用的镜头，说是中国人用门头的手段来拘捕民众，但实际上就是中国警察反恐训练的一个一个镜头。还有就是被一些媒体报揭露出来的。嗯，嗯，就是去去拍摄一些说我们怎么去干扰啊，或者说存在集中营也好啊。但后来事实证明，有关的人员并没有接受他的采访，也没有干扰他，他做了一些手段。你还说到这个 BBC 的这个 o f f c o m 的这个事情哈。I mean, first, just I just want to react really quickly to this.、Uh, just Hua Chunying's face is just priceless. And first of all, Chinese is a beautiful like her.、Uh, there are different dialects in China, and so you know, there's、uh, Sichuan and all kinds of other dialects. So depending on where you're from, it's just. But the Chinese language is so beautiful and diverse in that way, and just I mean, just listening to her, it's like it's like kind of a song. That's how I see、uh, the language. But she is just ripping apart the BBC right now. She is just saying one by one, and it gets better one by one. How the BBC has promoted propaganda, at one after the other, propaganda against China, while this person, this this editor, this chief editor, is telling Hua Chunying, a foreign. I mean, this is disrespectful. A foreign minister,、uh, spokesperson, foreign minister spokesperson, that somehow the BBC is insulted. The BBC should be ashamed of themselves for using a far right Christian fundamentalist. Uh, uh, in order, who thinks that they're on some kind of mission from God to end the Communist Party, and who you know is anti-Semitic and all sorts of other things, should be ashamed of that. Who literally、uh, rolls out uh, ridiculous uh, lies and smears about China to make money? They should feel bad about that.
But of course, they don't because they need Adrian Zenz to promote their narrative. Let's finish. This is very interesting. In fact, Ofcom is able to regulate many departments of the BBC. But you can also give it to the students to take a class. You can also tell them that Ofcom has the right to regulate the BBC international channel. What we see in the report is that Ofcom can regulate the BBC international channel in the UK. But it has the right to regulate the BBC international channel in the UK. It has the right to regulate the BBC international channel. 换言之，就是说 ，BBC 国内频道，它如果播出了假新闻，它是要受到 Ofcom 的监管，会受到惩罚。可是，它国际频道，它就不受任何的监管，它有尚方宝剑，它可以肆意的炮制虚假信息，而不受到任何法律方面的监管和制裁。这就是我从报道上公开的材料当中可以看到的。如果的确，你们 BBC 国际频道也是受到 Ofcom 的这种监管的。呃，也欢迎你可以告诉我们更多的 details。但是的确，英国的学者大威·塞奇威克出版了一本书，叫做《假工厂、假新闻工厂》，来自 BBC 的故事，认为现在 BBC 实际上就是一个顽固的政治竞选团体。这种转变显然违背了皇家特许证中对他的要求，就是要保持公正和政治的中立。这也是导致假新闻病毒在英国蔓延。而且呢？英国自己《每日快报》，这不是中国的讲的，也是有 BBC 的失败的文章提到了对英国的这个民意调查，发现一半的人都认为 BBC 在新闻报道方面是有失公允的。这就是为什么我们觉得 BBC 面临着一个信誉危机。你们自己需要采取行动，做出努力来改变人们对 BBC 的这种印象。你应该以更多客观公正、符合实际情况的新闻来证明 BBC。I mean, she eviscerated uh, Hua Chenying, eviscerated the BBC editor to the point where she was explaining how BBC is regulated to the BBC producer. I mean, this is all, of course, surrounding the Uyghur genocide myth, the Uyghur human rights issue, this weaponizing of human rights, using people like Adrian Zenz as the principal source. For accusations against China, which had no basis, in order to promote、uh, policies like U.S. sanctions, right? U.S. sanctions on uh, 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 Xinjiang in particular,、uh, but also to promote this narrative, uh, 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 to promote this narrative that China is, uh, uh, you know, in need of international、uh, censure because of its policy toward Uyghurs, and so Hua Chenying just absolutely. Just exposed BBC in front of the BBC,、uh, uh, listing off how the BBC absolutely has no、uh, regulation when it comes to its international news service, its world news service. It can say whatever it wants, it can print whatever it wants, and that this has had a deep impact on people's perceptions of the BBC. Because most people think, contrary to what we have in the West, when it comes to the Western mainstream media calling. Chinese and Russian media state affiliated. Most people see the BBC as a state affiliated media that it literally represents the interests of the government in London, in the UK. That's that's how most people see the BBC. And of course, it's not hard to discern that when it just publishes and regurgitates US and UK talking points, CIA, MI5 talking points about every global issue. So people are going to think that. Even people who agree with those positions are going to think that. They might not see anything wrong with it, but a lot of people are going to be a little critical and tune out, and that's what's happened. And so, to me, it's just absolutely endemic of the Western mainstream press to come in with such hubris, such disrespect to a foreign ministry spokesperson, right? Hua Chunying. And try to come after her and say, "How dare you badmouth our research with Adrian Zenz, our relationship with Adrian Zenz? Why are you so sensitive about Adrian Zenz? This guy is literally like he's like a prototype of what a fascist evangelical is. He is incredibly anti-Semitic, racist. He's written about the rapture and all this nonsense, this maddening nonsense. But also, he is a tool." Of the uh, uh, new Cold War propaganda apparatus, he works for the Victims of Memorial Communism Foundation, literally founded by the U.S. government to promote 
anti-communism in the mainstream after the fall of the Soviet Union and attributes all the deaths committed, all the killings committed by Nazis to the Soviet Union. And now all COVID deaths are being attributed to China. That's how rapidly racist and, and fascist the Victims of Memorial Communism Foundation is, which Adrian Zenz is a part of their China Studies Department. Really, he is just an arm of the CIA, and the BBC is just an extension of the same intelligence apparatus, and Hua Chenying was prepared. I mean, I think it's, it's impressive that China's foreign ministry is so prepared with these facts about those who smear them so badly and can delineate exactly what the problem is, exactly what the where the hypocrisy resides. And you could tell that this BBC producer, this, this top editor, was very much scared to bring this up. It's like she was feeling viscerally how insulted she was. She was triggered, right? She was a triggered lib, like literally. And Hua Chenying was like, well, the facts are the facts. And the facts are Adrian Zenz's nonsense. And the BBC has completely and utterly lost credibility if it ever had any, but it's definitely lost credibility. And here are all the examples of how you have smeared China. And also you need to think about what you're saying to me because Adrian Zenz literally says to himself, he was approached by the BBC. It doesn't matter about the particularities. He's talking about the BBC being basically coming to him groveling in order to forward his debunked and thoroughly uh, 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 discredited research all across outlets like the BBC. So I just wanted to play that video because it really does show the extent to which the propaganda apparatus will try to defend its propaganda. The war propaganda apparatus, part of this empire, will defend its propaganda at all costs. And there's just no better response than what Hua Chunying provided there. No better response than that one. So everyone, I am a little sick, okay? Um, <coughs> I wanted to get this interview in today with the great Claire Daly because uh, she's a very busy person and um, she's incredible. I mean, her record, her analysis is so consistent and so it was amazing, you know, to have her on. And of course, she didn't disappoint. That is in the playback. So if you came late, you can, of course, just scroll back. I'll keep the stream going. I also post clips. I will post clips, um, you know, as the weeks come along. Um, so also, I am, um, you know... Uh, looking to continue to make this work sustainable. So, of course, all of you here, thanks. So, oh, I'll do some thanking of the super chats before I go. I have a few minutes. Do um, support me on Patreon, though. Patreon.com slash Danny Haifong is the best way to support. There are yearly options available in the tiers. Okay. You can also join on YouTube. Substack is also available um, for subscriptions. And then uh, there's other options for one time donators as well. All of that is in the description. Now, let me thank some of these super chats. There were a lot. There were a lot. Let me see if I can get to them. Um, thank you, Johnny Ruskanin. Thank you so much. Let's see. Thanks so much for helping this channel grow, guys. We were up over 13, 1400 viewers. I think at peak when Claire was on. So uh, that's been kind of a theme now. And that's it's a really great spot to be in. Um, and let's keep making that happen. So, you know, make sure you're at the very least hitting the notifications bell, subscribing here. Um, so you know when I go live, because I do go live at least two or three times a week. <coughs> it may take a few days off. Um, Paul, thank you so much. Paul Wernke. I heard the lockdowns were to prevent bank runs. Some financial people said ours were also the Fed overnight repo window was spying out of control right before our lockdowns. I mean, there was some rumors about that in China. I don't think so, though. I can imagine it's hard to do bank runs in state-owned banks. 
um, which is most of China's banks. I don't think people were going to pull out of those. Um, I I don't I don't think there's any evidence for that in China. Now, for the United States, because a lot of the banking sector is held by speculators, I could see that. I could see that in an economic crisis, but China never had an economic crisis, so there really wouldn't be need for bank runs. China had some stagnation in the beginning during the harshest part of its lockdown, had some small growth, slow growth, but it came back up, so now it's moderate growth. I'm not sure if bank runs were really the issue here. Uh, but thank you so much for the super chat. I think one of the reasons, I think the biggest reasons for lockdowns in China is because of the SARS CoV uh, uh, experience, COVID experience, the SARS virus experience, and some of the errors they made being a little uh, too relaxed in their opinion. Also, China used to be called the quote unquote sick man of Asia. China um, was extremely underdeveloped and exploited. And with that underdevelopment and exploitation, China, a lot of people have died of China preventable diseases. So there's a lot of sensitivities culturally and socially around illness. And so when the virus hit and the SARS experience was already uh, kind of pretty close in the minds of people, it was quite obvious that China was going to take this very seriously. And I believe they did the right thing in terms of taking it very seriously and preventing deaths. And now it's about cleaning up the excesses and uh, uh, balancing what is a tough balance, which is people's health in the economy. Thank you so much for Neo Chats, um, for the Super Chat. Uh, Talking about COVID internment camps, not sure about that. I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, I don't think... I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't see that. But I would consider all prisons internment camps. I don't think the COVID situation is going to be paid attention to enough other than, yeah, it'll be used as a tool of repression. I believe that. But uh, let's see. Okay, any more, any more, any more? I should go in the next five. Let's see. There was definitely a lot more in the beginning, too. Very busy chat. Very busy chat. I'd like to thank all of you for giving the super chats. Thank you so much to Ophelia. Blowback of the USC will be painful when the people wake up. Thank you to Miss Daly and myself. Appreciate you. Free Palestine. Yes, yes, yes. Free Palestine. Thank you so much, Keith. For the super sticker. Here we go. Thank you so much. None OYB for the none of your business (laughs) for the super sticker. Uh, Good name there. Good name there. So uh, thank you, Al Boone, for the super chat. Many thanks to Claire for calling out the hypocrisy. Yes. Neo Chat says, Claire Daly, we need to talk. It's very important. Please listen to me. There isn't much time. Thanks for the super chat. Golden Silence, thanks so much. She's always spitting. Yes, she is. Amazing. Claire Daly was amazing today. Nikolai, thanks for the super chat. The people in parliament decided to ignore the people of Donbass or their people who legitimately don't understand this conflict. I think it's both, but... I would say there's been a lot of ignoring. I don't I don't think I would have loved to ask her that, but so sorry about that. But thank you so much for the super chat. But I think it's both. <clears throat> I think both can easily exist. But I do think it's more nefarious. I do think it's an intentional ignoring of of them. You know, the people of Don Bass, it's a, it's been a genocide and and that's and they've been ignored. So thanks so much Golden Silence. Much respect. Yes, they will keep punching up. Thanks so much for the generous super chat, Alex Shirazi, who says, great stream, very high level guest. Miss Daly, I'm honored to see your work. You're on the right side of history. Thanks so much. Yes, she is. Um, uh, thanks so much. Um, 
Let's see. Thank you so much, David Falconer from Hong Kong. Claire Mick keeps speaking up for poor people of the global south and exposed U.S. hypocrisy. Thanks so much. Thanks so much again, Golden Silence. Love your consistent nuclear volume voice in these turbulent times. We support you keep calling a spade a spade. Stay strong and gut. With... <coughs> I got to say, she has a, an incredible speaking voice. I could listen to Claire Daly all day long. All day long. Um, thanks so much for your generous super chats today, guys. This this has been great. And again, Golden Silence, so much of your generosity is very appreciated. Yes, they are. The only sane voices, Claire Daly and Mick Wallace. Thanks, A.K. Lee. Love your courage and sane voice to Claire Daly. Continue to challenge and support. She love uh, you love their work. Thank you so much. Uh, I do too. She was a great guest to have on. Thanks so much, Ophelia. Again, thanks so much, Lin Zhao Long. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, some butt four one five. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everyone. Um, I'm probably going to head out now to doing those thank yous. Um, I'm going to put in, oh, uh, thank you, Yanni Zhang, for the super sticker. Uh, I think that's it. I'm going to head out now. Uh, of course, share, subscribe, hit the notifications bell. The most important thing to do, though, is, of course, to support this show, uh, whether you're supporting it by leaving a tip on Rockfin. Most best way is to be an annual or a monthly subscriber on Patreon. Substack, or on YouTube. So you can find all those options in the link in the description. The YouTube join button is all over the place, but it will be um, to the right of uh, right on, uh, under the title of this video. It's also in the main YouTube channel page to the top right-hand corner underneath the banner. It says join. So you can become a member um, as well. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I'll be back again soon. Um, and hopefully I'll be less under the weather then when I do end up coming back. All right, take care. Uh, have a nice weekend, and I should see you probably some point next week. Bye-bye.